Welcome everyone to CRC Talks. I'm Mary Ann Pearson, Senior Director of Patient Navigation and Family Support. CRC Talks is an alliance program to help amplify critical conversations that happen between providers and patients. We hold CRC Talks every two months on, a, on various topics from treatment to survivorship, plus screening and everything in between. Watch the Alliance's social media channels and emails, email newsletters for updates. We're so glad that all of you could join us today. This afternoon's program is brought to you by our generous corporate supporters, Merck, Takeda Oncology, and Taiho Oncology. Thank you all for your generous support. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We will reserve time at the end of the program to answer any questions you may have. You can ask your questions by clicking the Q&A button in the bottom of the screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. Following this talk, you will be directed to a short one minute survey. We'd really appreciate your participation. Finally, to watch this later, you can find it on the Alliance website and bluehq.org. Just search CRC Talks in your favorite browser. Now I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Valerie Williams is a level two clinical dietitian at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She received her master's degree of science from Chatham University and is a certified specialist in both oncology nutrition and nutrition support. On top of the long list of credentials, she's also a great friend. Thank you so much for being here, Valerie. Thank you so much for having me. Let me get my screen shared and we'll get started. Great. I'm excited to have so many of, many of you on here today with me. It's just one second. You'd think I'd be slicker at this by now. Right. We're looking good. Perfect. All right. As Marianne so lovingly introduced, my name is Valerie Williams. I am a registered dietitian. I've been working in oncology for over a decade, it really is my passion area. So I'm excited to hopefully share some information with you today. Uh, so we are gonna pack a lot into a short period of time. Luckily, you can always view this again later. Um, and so we're gonna start going to start by talking about the role of adequate nutrition during and after cancer, why it's so important, methods to optimize your nutrition during treatment related to your side effects and other challenges that you're experiencing, um, as well as common cancer myths and misconceptions. And lastly, ways to adapt your diet to manage the long-term impacts of colorectal cancer and promote long-term health. As Marianne said, you can always add questions to the Q&A box as we go, um, and she'll be fielding those with me at the end. So why does nutrition matter? I'm a lot of times I feel like nutrition is not always at the forefront of conversations in cancer or a lot of diseases because it's not a burning fire. It's more so the base that is the foundation for you to do better during any kind of um, disease and treatment, cancer included. So adequate nutrition during cancer, during and after cancer care can help you to feel better. Maintain your strength and energy, which then allows you to do the things in life that are important to you. Um, maintain your weight and nutrient stores. Better tolerate treatment-related side effects and potentially get better outcomes from your treatment, which is always our goal as clinicians, patients, and caregivers. Uh, lower infection risk. Promote healing and recovery, and then in the long term, prevent cancer recurrence and decrease the risk of other cancers. So there are many factors that influence the nutrition decisions that you as a patient make after your cancer diagnosis. I'm sure many of you, if we were in a room, I would ask you how many people have been told by friends, family, acquaintances, a person on the bus oh, sugar feeds cancer, don't eat dairy, don't eat cheese, put down the coffee. Every food under the world can be a positive or a negative. And it can be really hard to know what to eat because you're trying to think about what you should choose, what you should avoid, what's labeled as healthy, um, what you like to eat, um, how much food preparation you can do, how your treatment and cancer side effects are impacting you, how tired you are, and do you want to cook? other life demands, and many other things influence your ability and willingness to eat during treatment and the foods that you choose. So
So first, we're going to start by talking about goals during cancer treatment. And the goals during cancer treatment can be and often are much different than they are in cancer prevention and in cancer survivorship. And sometimes I think patients are a little disappointed because they feel really basic. But as many of you who may be going through active treatment right now know, sometimes it's hard to even just do the basics. And so don't underestimate the challenge and benefits of meeting your basic nutrition needs. And that is your calories, your protein, and your fluids. And so these each play a vital role in giving your body the fuel that it needs to take the treatment, utilize it properly, and remain strong. So first you have your calories, and that really comes in any protein, carbohydrates, and fat that you're eating. And calories provide energy to support all functions of the body. So they're like gas in your gas tank of your car. Um, And calorie needs may be increased for some patients during treatment. Not all patients need more calories to maintain their nutrition status, but, but you may need more calories than you're used to eating. An inadequate calorie intake leads to weight loss. And unfortunately, in the setting of cancer, when you lose weight, your metabolism has shifted because of the cancer and you lose muscle. You don't lose your love handles or your muffin top. You lose your valuable leg muscles, arm muscles, and your strength. And so that's why we want to make sure you get enough calories to maintain your weight. And then you have protein. And protein is important as well. I think a lot of times people prioritize protein over calories. In my opinion, you need both. They kind of help each other. And so adequate intake of both is going to get you the furthest. And protein is the building block of your cells. They help to ensure growth and repair of tissue and maintain your immune system. Your protein needs are often higher during cancer treatment because many of the treatments destroy cells. Chemotherapy destroys cells that divide quickly and your body is working to rebuild those healthy cells. Surgery damages a lot of cells that makes big wounds that your body is then rushing to rebuild. Um, So that is the reason that your protein needs are likely higher during treatment than they have been in the past. Um, An inadequate protein intake leads to a slower recovery, a slower healing process from surgery, a slower bounce back from from radiation or from um, your systemic treatment. It also can lead to lower resistance to infection and muscle loss. Um, which I'm sure many of you are nodding your head. It's very common for patients to experience muscle loss rather quickly, which then can lead to lower strength and um, energy levels. And then you have fluids. And I always tell patients if they're having a really bad day where you feel like you just can barely do anything, hydration and fluids is always the most important job. Um, Because if you become dehydrated, you can become... um, have more nausea, more constipation, fatigue, lightheadedness, weakness. And so hydration is always the priority, first and foremost. And the general recommendation is eight to 10 cups, but it may be different based on your weight. And um, also if you're losing fluid through an ostomy or through diarrhea or vomiting, you may have higher fluid needs. What I always tell people is all liquids count toward fluid intake. So we always talk water. And of course, water is number one for hydration. But during treatment, especially, we count all fluids, the broth in soup, jello, ice cream, popsicles, um, all count toward your fluid during that time, including things like juice and milk. And then you want to also consume foods high in water content that can help you to stay hydrated, such as watermelon, hence the name, cucumbers, grapes, and lettuce all contain some natural water, which can help your hydration. So although this seems very easy, when you're in the throes of treatment and experiencing side effects, it can be harder um, to get these basics in. So I always like to make sure people are meeting these basics before we add other changes. So what are my tips for nutrition during treatment before we move into talking about side effect management? You want to avoid weight loss during treatment. I know I'm a lady. I like to lose a little weight if I need to, you know, if I eat too many cookies at Christmas. But what during cancer treatment is one time where we really want you to hold on to the pounds that you come to us with. We know that a patient that maintains their weight has better outcomes from their treatment. 
That's why it's so important. And the whole team is on top of keeping your weight as stable as possible. You also want to focus on that hydration as we discussed. Listen to your body as if you listen to it, it will guide you to the foods that it really needs at that time, such as some broth or soup if you need a little extra salt or some saltines if your stomach is a little upset. Um, So really let your body guide you toward foods that may be better tolerated. Now is not the time for drastic diet changes. Um, You've had a a lot of years to make crazy changes. You don't want to do a lot of changes while you're going through treatment because your body already has enough um, changes to deal with. You also want to follow food safety guidelines, especially if you're on chemotherapy that decreases your immune system. And so that would be um, your, your nurses can always help you with more details or your dietitian, but that would be in short eating keeping cold foods cold, hot foods hot, and avoiding foods that are known to have foodborne illness risks, such as raw fish, raw oysters, raw eggs um, during this time. You also want to make sure you discuss any vitamin, mineral, and herbal supplements with your oncologist prior to starting. Although these are often naturally derived, especially herbal supplements, they do often act like medicine in the body. And they can interact with other medicines. They can protect the very cancer cells that we're trying to destroy. So while they may have a place in your overall plan, it's very important that it's part of a discussion with your oncology team. And you want to use those medicines that the oncologist gives you. How many of you have started chemo and they give you, you go to the pharmacy and you pick up a huge bag of medicine. That's because we want to control those symptoms. And so making sure that You're taking the medicine as directed so that your side effects are better managed, and then you'll be able to eat better. So let's talk a little bit about common challenges that you may face during treatment. And we're going to go through some of the top ones. And these may be challenges you face during treatment or that you face at the time of diagnosis or in recovery. Um, So first is low appetite. And this can be very common. It may come and go depending on your chemotherapy or treatment schedule, Um, and it can make it difficult to eat. It can take the biggest eater and make them eat very little. So what do you do about that? Uh, You want to think of your food as medicine and take your meals and your snacks on a schedule. Uh, We recommend consuming small frequent meals on a schedule, typically every two to three hours, trying to have a little something to eat or drink and maximizing intake at the time of day when your appetite is best. Many patients feel like breakfast or lunch is when they have the most energy, they feel the most hungry. And so eat your bigger meal at that time versus forcing a large meal at dinner when you're really not feeling up for it. Also, if you're going to push yourself to eat, let's make it worth it. Pick high calorie, high protein food choices. Um, If you're forcing yourself to eat, it's not the time to eat celery sticks by themselves. Maybe if you do celery and hummus or celery and peanut butter, little ants on a log, that would be fine. You just want to make sure that you're really making the most of the times that you do eat. You also can use easy to prepare and convenience foods to promote intake and preserve energy. When you're not hungry, who wants to cook? I don't want to cook when I am hungry. So I'm having things that are ready to go that you can grab easily and maybe are individually packaged like string cheese, hard boiled eggs, pudding cup um, can make eating on that schedule much easier. Also, if you're having trouble eating, think about doing oral nutrition supplements or drinks that have calories in them like hot chocolate, chocolate milk, smoothies made with yogurt or protein powder. It's often easier to drink your calories than it is to eat the equivalent amount of calories. So many people will incorporate a drink like that into their day once or multiple times just to get those calories in. And then manage your symptoms. This is going to be a theme throughout. If you're nauseous, you're constipated, you're not going to want to eat. So we have to make sure that you're taking care of those issues. And if you're trying many of these tricks and your appetite continues to be low, have a conversation with your oncologist. There are a handful of medications available that can increase your appetite. And so if it becomes a prolonged issue, um, that is something to definitely speak with your team about. 
And then I wanted to put some caregiver tips in there because I'm sure we have some fabulous caregivers on the line today. Um, Try providing six to eight small meals a day and keep the portion small. What tricky caregivers do is they try to serve a big portion to trick the person into eating more. And what all that's going to do is make your your patient want to quit eating before they even get started. It's going to overwhelm them. And so keep the portions small but frequent. And be encouraging, but try not to nag or fight about food because then it can become an anxiety-provoking event for, for both the patient and you as the caregiver. The next common challenge is taste changes. And Unfortunately, a lot of these challenges come together, so you may have low appetite and taste changes. And taste changes can come from medications. It's also a common side effect of chemotherapies. Um, Because chemotherapy destroys cells that divide quickly, your taste buds and the lining of your mouth is part of that. And so you may find that your taste is dulled or changed. Um, That can also come from the medications itself can cause taste changes. And so for bland taste, you want to bump up the flavor. You want to choose fruity, like tropical fruit, citrus, or salty flavors of foods and use marinades, herbs, spices, citrus, vinegar, pickles, and sauces. So you want to take a plain food like a chicken breast and you want to add something like barbecue sauce or sweet and sour sauce or put it in Italian dressing as a marinade. A bland food is going to probably taste like cardboard. So you really need to layer on the flavors. So things like watermelon sprinkled with salt or uh, Chinese food that has a sweet and sour flavor to it or teriyaki sauce or even Mexican food is often tastier because it has multiple flavors and it makes your taste buds have to work harder and have more flavors to pick up on. For bitter or metallic taste, and metallic taste can be a common side effect of a chemotherapy called oxaliplatin, and that's often used in colorectal cancers. And so you may experience this. You want to eat sweet fruits, uh, try strongly flavored foods to try to mask that metallic taste, and try sweet or sour beverages such as lemonade or limeade. Another good trick for this that didn't make my slide is if you have metallic taste, try try using plastic or wooden silverware or utensils versus metal silverware because the metal taste of metal utensils or cans, metal water bottles um, can make that metallic taste worse. So switching those out can be helpful. Also maintain good oral hygiene and rinse your mouth with baking soda and salt water rinses to keep your mouth clean and also clear out any buildup that may be um, be building up. And then if you're having trouble with smells, um, eat colder room temperature foods, cook, avoid cooking areas. So stay out of the kitchen, have that husband do the cooking for you and use a cup with a lid and a straw. That way it keeps the smells inside. That's especially helpful for Uh, nutrition drinks that may have a little bit of a vitamin smell, a cup and a lid, a cup with a lid and a straw goes a long way. For those caregivers, uh, one food group that can be tough with taste changes is high protein foods like chicken, fish, beef, pork. Um, Try incorporating those into recipes such as lasagna, chicken pot pie, shepherd's pie, um, chili, as that often makes them more appealing than a piece of meat on the plate. Um, Also think outside the box and provide a variety of food choices. Oftentimes when someone has cancer, everyone wants to bring them their favorite foods, right? They want you to eat, so they show up with your favorites. The problem with that is that your brain remembers what those taste like, and so it's much more disappointing when they don't taste good. And so I encourage you to think about foods that maybe you like, but you don't eat often. They may actually taste better. All right, let's move right along. I told you we had a lot to cover today. Um, Common challenge, diarrhea. And then we have, um, we will talk about constipation and ostomies as well. And so diarrhea can come from from damage to the absorptive surfaces of your intestines. So consuming small, frequent meals help to promote absorption and allow that smaller amount of food to be utilized better by the body. If you're having active diarrhea, eating a low fat, low fiber diet during that time 
Um, also limiting caffeine, alcohol, and highly spiced foods as they can stimulate bowel movements. If you're noticing that diarrhea is worse when you consume something like milk or ice cream, limit those lactose containing foods at that time. You can always try something like a lactate milk um, as an option if you are lactose intolerant. Um, additionally, consume adequate fluid and increase intake when experiencing diarrhea. Add a cup of fluid for each loose bowel movement is a rule of thumb to help you with that hydration. Also, um, add electrolyte containing fluids if you're having diarrhea, because with diarrhea, you lose electrolytes like sodium and potassium. So consuming liquids like broth, sports drinks, oral rehydration solutions, and coconut water can help to replace those electrolytes. Caregivers, encourage fluid, fill up the cup frequently, and also keep a record of bowel movement so you can help to provide a detailed report to the oncologist so that they can help you with those issues. Then we go to the opposite side. And unfortunately, sometimes patients have both diarrhea and constipation that alternates. So constipation though, I feel like is everyone's enemy. It all, it's very uncomfortable. And once a person has been constipated, they never wanna experience it again. Um, and so for constipation, number one rule, consume adequate fluid. The body moves bowel movements out by pulling fluid into the intestine. If you're dehydrated and there's not enough fluid, it can't do that. Um, if appropriate, and this is not for everyone, increase your dietary fiber intake and incorporate probiotic containing foods like yogurt. Fiber is not always the answer to constipation depending on where it's coming from. Because constipation can come from your diet, it can also come from side effects of medications like pain medications and anti-nausea medications. So talk with your team about if increasing fiber is helpful or not for you. You can also consume a hot beverage or a hot cereal as part of your daily routine, both, both the warmth and for some of the hot beverages, the caffeine can serve as a bowel stimulant and the warmth can also relax your bowels to maybe allow you to have a bowel movement more easily. So that's an easy one to add, especially in the winter. Um, additionally, engage in light physical activity. Moving your muscles can also help you to move your bowels. So um, taking a little walk, moving around the house a bit more. And be proactive. Use your bowel medications as directed. Don't wait till you haven't had a bowel movement for five days to start taking that medicine that they gave you, because then you're way behind it. We're aiming for you to have bowel movements regularly, ideally every one to two days, which may be different dependent on what your team recommends. Um, but we want to stay on top of it if you're needing help with the medications. Caregivers, again, encourage those fluids, make them a cup of tea or coffee um, and walk with them. You know, it's easier to be active if you have a buddy. And then our last common challenge we're going to talk about today is the ostomy. And the ostomy in itself is a huge learning curve. And then you put the cancer and cancer treatment on top of it. Um, and we can do a whole talk just about ostomies for those of you who have them. Um, so I encourage that you work with your oncology team and also your dietitian to help you troubleshoot your individual ostomy issues. Um, but typical ostomy output can be different for an ileostomy versus a colostomy. After surgery, your surgeon will likely have you moder moderating and adjusting the amount of fiber that you're eating as you heal. You also want to make sure you're consuming a high fiber diet for at least a month after surgery. And then ask your surgeon when you can start to add more, more variety of foods. Diet advancement would be slowly adding high fiber foods to your diet. So things like fresh raw fruits and vegetables and whole grains, I always recommend adding one new food a day so you can evaluate if you tolerate it or not. If you eat a bunch of new foods in one day, you don't know what worked and what didn't. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but hydration is very important. It's especially important with the ileostomy because you don't have a colon to absorb all the water. And so it's very um, common that people get dehydrated who have an ileostomy. So making sure that you're drinking enough fluids and that you're sipping on those fluids throughout the day, don't chug them because those of you who have an ileostomy may notice if you chug fluids, it just chugs right on out your ileostomy. And so I'm um, sipping on fluids throughout the day. 
Also making sure you're getting enough electrolytes, especially for that team with the ileostomies because their ostomy losses can contain electrolytes like sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Um, so especially ileostomies, you will lose additional sodium. So you may find yourself eating and needing to eat more foods that contain salt during that time. Caregivers, be there with the drinks. Also be there to record ostomy output as needed so you can report it to the team. Again, I think it's really helpful to work with the dietitian if you have a new ostomy so that you can feel really comfortable. So let's review what you're supposed to do during treatment because then we're going to move into survivor, surviving and thriving and the myth busters. And so during treatment, you want to maintain that stable weight. You want to hydrate, um, consume adequate calories and protein, Avoid unnecessary diet restrictions. Now is not the time to make your life harder. You have enough challenges. Let's not add more. Um, manage your treatment-related side effects. The medicines are there for a reason, um, and your team is there to help you with those. And be physically active when possible. It may not be running marathons, but take a 10-minute walk, or I tell patients often who aren't very active, walk around your house on the commercials of your TV show. Um, that way you have a few tiny little sprints of activity and it builds in those cues for you to be active. This sounds difficult or it might sound like it's not hard enough, but these tend to be the tips that I find that people, if they apply them, they do, they do better during treatment and they feel like they're kind of checking all their boxes. So let's go into survivorship nutrition. And when I mention survivorship nutrition, there's multiple definitions of survivorship, but this is more so after you've completed your treatment um, and you're starting to think about what the rest of your life looks like. And so goals after cancer treatment, first and foremost, is to consume essential nutrients to promote recovery. So you're still healing. You know, when you finish that last chemo, your body doesn't automatically go back to normal. You still have recovery to do for several months after you've had the surgery or, or the other treatments. Um, as able though, you want to start to shift your focus to a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Oftentimes during treatment, especially chemotherapy, we say, eat whatever you can. We just need you to eat. Well, eventually you have to come off of that focus and start to add in a, a wider variety of foods. You also want to continue to adjust your food choices for disease and symptom related side effects. You may never have the same digestive tract that you did before this diagnosis. So you might not be able to go back to that big kale salad um, or things that you ate in the past. You may need to eat a little bit differently and that's okay. It's nice to embrace that and incorporate those needs. And remember, a nutrition after treatment looks different for each person, especially because when you have a cancer of the digestive tract, it affects the digestive tract is very important. So your diet and your ability to eat is going to be different than somebody who has a cancer that doesn't affect digestion, like breast cancer or prostate cancer. So as you're making changes, keep that in mind. You're unique. You need changes made just for you. So what does eating during survivorship look like? So ideally, we know that a diet high in whole grains, so that would be things like whole wheat bread, rye bread, pumpernickel, uh, quinoa, brown rice, just to give some examples, vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, and seeds is recommended. This helps to lead toward a high fiber diet, and we know that um, a diet of 30 grams of fiber is shown to be cancer protective. 30 grams of fiber can be a lot for someone who's coming off of a diet filled with applesauce, bananas, saltines, and chicken. Um, so don't feel like you have to get there right away, but working to increase your fiber is helpful. Um, also, limit your intake of fast foods and other processed foods. While they may be delicious in the moment or easy, um, they are high in fat, starches, and sugars, um, and they're often not bringing other beneficial items to the table like um, vitamins, antioxidants, and fiber. And so while you can have a treat, if you find your car going through the drive through it's fine as a treat. You want to limit it um, in regular consumption. You also want to limit your red meat intake, and we will talk about this a little more in detail, 
to no more than 12 to 18 ounces per week per the American Institute for Cancer Research. One group that we say less is better is your processed meat group. And we will talk about if you're thinking, what's a processed meat? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and then limit your sugar sweetened beverage intake. So things like regular sodas, sweetened iced tea, those fancy coffee drinks that you find yourself in the drive through for, again, just like your fast food, often bring calories and sugar without a lot of other um, nutrition benefits. Limit your alcohol intake. Um, less is better when it comes to alcohol. If you do consume alcohol, it's typically recommended that you keep it to a uh, one serving uh, per day at most, but less is, is better. And then maintain some lifestyle factors, maintain a healthy weight. This would be the time dependent on discussion with your team that it may be appropriate for some intentional weight loss, um, but not until you're healed up, recovering and thriving. And then be physically active. The recommendation is 150 minutes a week. Again, if you're going from couch potato you don't have to go to 150 minutes right away. You want to work your way up. And if that sounds like a lot, let me break it down a little less to you. 30 minutes, five days a week is what that would look like. And it doesn't have to be high intensity training where you're, you know, sweating buckets that can be taking a walk. So I like to show this slide when I'm talking to people with colorectal cancer and how they can start to move back to a regular or a healthier eating plan. Because it can be hard when you're not sure what your digestion is going to do. Your bowels may never be the same. So you may have to find where your threshold is of what you can eat in regards to more fibrous and difficult to digest foods. So I really like this slide and this is how I typically teach people as they're going from a low fiber or an easy to digest diet to more variety of those foods. You wanna start with things that are easier to digest. So peeled raw fruits like apples, papaya, plums, peaches, um, cooked fruit or canned fruit, applesauce, small servings of avocado, the cooked simple vegetables like green beans, carrots, squash, peeled potatoes and sweet potatoes, and then work your way up to adding a little bit of seeds and skins, your gas producing vegetables that are in the middle column, some simple raw vegetables, um, and see how you do. You know, if you do well with that, then you can graduate to those toughest um, fruits and vegetables like dried fruits, corn and peas, which are, are known to be tough, raw greens and, and big salads, beans, nuts and seeds and popcorn. So if you're nervous about getting back in the game of eating some of those higher fiber um, fruits, vegetables and grains, this is a good progression for you to follow. So let's now look at cancer nutrition myths and misconceptions. This is one of my favorite parts because um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And as many of you have experienced, when people learn you have cancer, everybody has advice. Your friend, your family, the guy sitting next to you on the bus. And so it's hard to navigate. And I think a lot of people feel confused. They also feel almost guilty about their food choices because they're not sure if they're the right choices or not. So I'm hoping to help give you a little peace of mind with these next few slides. Uh, so one is the plant-based diet. Very trendy, um, catchy terminology. You see it a lot of places. You see it on um, food packaging and advertisements. So the plant-based diet focuses primarily on plants. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans. Um, and choosing foods from those sources. But it does not necessarily mean plants only. So when you see something that, um, when someone's following a plant-based diet, they may still be incorporating animal foods into the mix, such as meat or dairy. And so you can often implement a plant-forward diet by limiting your animal proteins to a quarter of your plate. So you can see where you look at this chicken plate at the bottom, Yes, there's chicken there, but there's also half filled with veggies and a really good looking quinoa rice mix on there as well. And that is a plant forward plate that would be great when you move into the survivorship plan. Um, and think about you don't have to go from a big steak and a potato to that plate that's in the corner overnight if that's difficult. 
get started by adding an extra serving of vegetables each day or making your veggie serving at your meals a little bit bigger. And then you can always build from there. Red meat. This is one that when I meet with a lot of patients, they say to me, oh, I stopped eating all red meat. And that's fine. If you want to do that, that is fine. There is evidence that eating high amounts of red meat increases the risk of CRC because of the heme iron that is in red meat um, can promote the formation of potentially carcinogenic compounds. Red meat includes beef, pork, contrary to the marketing, the other white meat, it is red meat, goat, and lamb. So if you partake in these red meats, that all counts in. And so it can be, according to the American Institute for Cancer Research, Research included in diet in moderation. Moderation is 12 to 18 ounces or less per week. And you want to think that a deck of cards or the palm of your hand, no fingers, just palm, counts as three to four ounces. So you can do about three to four servings a week of your red meat and still be considered under the safe limitation. When you can, you want to choose leaner cuts of red meat. Um, and you can also think about using red meat in mixed dishes where there's other foods. So stir fries, stews, chilies, and add other protein sources like beans, tofu, um, to help round out the flavor and the nutrition. Chili is a great example of how to take red meat and stretch it out with the beans. Now we got processed meat. And this is one that makes everyone nervous. And also we don't always know what is a processed meat. So the recommendation is to eat little, if any, processed meat. And processed meats are meats that are produced from smoking, curing, or adding additives such as nitrites or nitrates. And so this includes bacon, sausage, hot dogs, uh, pepperoni, ham, corned beef, deli meat, um, bologna, and salami, just to name a few. And so there is thoughts that Evidence supports eating that eating processed meats increases the risk of colorectal cancer as the compounds used to make these products may damage the gut lining. So the recommendation is eat as little of this as you can. Um, there is some gray area because in response to this, there was a creation of products labeled uncured or no added nitrates or nitrates. And this adds some confusion because we, while they may not be added, there may be naturally occurring versions of these products, um, including celery powder or celery seed. And it's unclear if these products that contain these natural nitrates are better choices. So you still want to consume these in, in moderation and with caution. So then you're thinking, well, what do I pack in my lunch? Try using leftover roasted or rotisserie chicken or turkey. Um, you have, tuna is a great um, healthy option, egg salad or peanut butter and banana sandwich as sandwich fillings um, because it can be hard to figure out what to substitute when you take things out. Let's, blah, let's next move on, I'm getting tongue tied here, to dairy foods. Uh, this is another food group where people will come to me and say, I cut out all dairy. And I'm like, why? Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be cut out. Now, the, the data regarding dairy foods does vary cancer to cancer, but there has been a link shown between lower CRC risk in people with higher intake of calcium-rich dairy products, including milk and cheese. There's some suggestion that the research shows calcium helps to reduce irritation in the colon and the lactic acid-producing bacteria protect against colorectal cancer. So think about choosing low fat dairy products and incorporating yogurt or kefir with live cultures as the source of calcium. And then those products will also provide um, beneficial probiotics coming in from the yogurt or the kefir. If you're lactose intolerant, you can try lactose free milk. Also, some people with lactose intolerance can tolerate hard cheeses such as cheddar or Swiss or Parmesan and yogurt as the, the, the cheese and yogurt making process will de decreases the lactose in those foods. So you may find that you can consume some of those options. And then we have sugar. 
if I had a dollar for every time a nervous patient tells me sugar feeds cancer and I ate ice cream, it is nerve wracking because people are so definitive when they mention sugar and cancer. And is it true? And I'm here to tell you that is not as simple as sugar. You eat it and your cancer grows like a cartoon. And so there, there is no need to be overly fearful if you eat sugar in moderation. Simple sugar or glucose, which is what carbohydrates are broken down into in part, feeds all cells. And it is found in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and dairy, as well as your sweets and sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, it's so important. Glucose is so important that if you do not consume carbohydrates, your body will make glucose from, from other foods that you consume. So it's not as simple as eliminate glucose and starve your cancer cells. While I wish it was and that I just would educate on no sugar all the time, it is not that simple. Um, and so there's no need to fully eliminate carbohydrates or to fully eliminate your sugar intake. Um, we do recommend if you're able and you're eating well to be cognizant of the added sugar that you're eating, especially if it's, if you're uh, consuming sugary beverages or, or regular desserts and sweets, you know, trying to limit those because they often only bring sugar to the table and they don't bring a lot of other nutrients. So focusing on your healthier sources of carbohydrates including fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. But if you're having a day where it's eat ice cream or eat nothing, and you're on treatment, I want you to eat the ice cream because nutrition and getting those calories in is extra important during that time. But I want you to take a deep breath knowing that, we, that the moniker sugar feeds cancer is not simple or supported as it sounds and that you can still um, incorporate many foods in moderation. And then we have probiotics. This is another catchy topic um, that I think we're going to hear more and more about as they do more research. Uh, but there are thoughts that the imbalance, imbalance of the gut microbiome, which is all the little microorganisms in our digestive tract, can cause inflammation and suppress activity of immune cells, which then contributes to the development of colorectal cancer. This is where it gets tricky is people say, well, should I take a probiotic pill? We don't necessarily have data to support how helpful that is. Also, one of the challenges is that there's so many strains of probiotics and we don't know what strains you necessarily need versus I need. We could have two different kinds of probiotic parties going on in our body. And so that's why the, the recommendations regarding supplement supplementation of probiotics is limited but we do encourage consuming probiotic containing foods such as yogurt and kefir, um, some new foods that maybe you haven't tried like fermented soy, including miso, tempeh and tamari, um, some fermented condiments like relishes and pickled ginger. So that stuff that comes with your sushi, uh, fermented beverages, including kombucha and um, fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, kimchi, and pickled cucumber as natural sources of probiotics. Also, keep in mind that prebiotics, which are from fiber-rich foods and are the, the fuel source for probiotics, um, are helpful as well. And we're getting down on our myth list. The next is vitamin, mineral, and herbal supplements. I oftentimes have patients who have started a plethora of supplements from their diagnosis or want a list from me. The challenge is, is that we don't really have the data to support wide spanning supplement recommendations. And supplements are not recommended, recommended for cancer prevention or survivorship. Um, the consumption of, food, of nutrients through food and drink is more likely to protect against cancer than the supplements as they try to take a compound out of, um, out of fruits and vegetables, it can be difficult to then make it be as effective as a supplement. So um, it's not recommended that you routinely use supplements. As I mentioned, you wanna make sure that you talk with your oncologist prior to starting any supplements. If you do want to think about supplements people typically take, you wanna think about how you can use those in food. And so thinking about um, adding things like curry powder or turmeric, garlic into your recipes, getting calcium through your food, 
magnesium um, and omega-3s through consuming fatty fish as listed here. We take a food first approach. Um, and so I encourage you to think about how you can do that too. So in conclusion, because we want to get to those questions, um, colorectal cancer presents challenges starting with diagnosis through survivorship. It can be a tough path nutritionally. Um, each patient's journey is unique and there's not a one size fits all plan. Your diet should be adjusted based on your treatment, your side effects to promote optimal nutrition and support your goals and seek guidance from a registered dietitian. Ask your oncologist who they use as a dietitian. Very well, there could be dietitians in your center. You just haven't been introduced to them yet. Um, and oncology specialized dietitians can build you that individualized plan and help you to predict what your next steps need to be. So I can turn it over to Marianne for questions. Um, there are some resources here that I find very helpful um, and provide to my patients regularly for your use. So Marianne, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was so wonderful and so informative. I was watching the questions and the questions were coming up at the same time that you were talking about them. So it was like perfect, perfect um, on topic. Um, I'm looking through a few of them and um, a few have kind of want to go back to um, your nutrition and muscle loss. Can you kind of, and, and versus fat, can you kind of just go over that one more time? Yeah, sorry. Sometimes I throw that out there quickly because I'm not always sure if maybe I don't want to be a broken record or say things people already know. So cancer um, does a lot behind the scenes and is doing a lot before you even um, present with your cancer. One thing that it does is it makes a chemical called cytokines and th those chemicals can decrease your appetite and also make you feel full and not as hungry. So oftentimes people are dealing with that. Also the cancer itself can change your metabolism so that you metabolize differently, including that when you lose weight, instead of losing fat like you normally would if you were cutting calories you know, for a big vacation or something, your metabolism has changed and you actually lose muscle more quickly. And so it's, a, it's a, a worse kind of weight loss because you're not losing that fat, you're losing that muscle and that strength. And so that's why even if you feel like you have a few extra pounds, we really try to hold on to them because we don't want it to result in losing the muscle. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I think um, we also have kind of a caregiver um, question around how to manage um, grocery shopping when taste changes keep happening or appetite changes and, and kind of talking about a strategy of how caregivers or family friends can meet the nutritional um, needs, but knowing that the nutrition, um, what sounds good and what tastes good changes all the time. That's a very big challenge. And I'm this is one time where shopping at a big uh, warehouse store like Costco, BJ's, now is not the time to buy in bulk yeah. um, because yeah. taste changes can come up quickly. So I do recommend a, a couple of tricks. Again, not buying a lot of any one thing because what often happens is that your family member really likes strawberry yogurt. And so you go buy 10 and then they feel pressure to eat it, but they're not in the strawberry yogurt anymore. So I recommend trying to maybe shop every few days. Also making a list of things that, that your patient is willing to eat. Because sometimes it can get hard when you say to them, what do you want to eat? And they look at you with like side eye, like I don't want to eat anything. And so making a list of the least offensive foods that you can always fall back on and having those around can be helpful. Um, that way you're not feeling like you're kind of chasing, chasing your tail, trying to make those, those recommendations, um, I think is helpful. Also sometimes relying on prepared food or picking food up out from a restaurant, because then you can go off the whims a little bit more. I think if you're a meal planner and you're like, well, tomorrow for dinner, I'm making spaghetti and your person doesn't want that, that can be very challenging. So trying to make things more on the fly or pick things up as they sound good 
And also using easy to prepare things like grilled cheese, peanut butter and jelly, cheese and crackers that you can throw together fast before that taste kind of fleets away. Great. Thank you. It's a tough um, one though. What? It's a tough one. It makes the it is. work hard. It is. <laughs> and, it, and a lot of people um, struggle with what to, to, to go grocery shopping and then wasting food yes. and the cost of food. And so that kind of doing it in short time frames, a day at a two at a time, if families can do that, um, tends to help patients um, get more nutrition because they're not um, buying in bulk. Yes. Right. Um, kind of a unique question that I haven't heard before, but is um, smoked salmon or lox considered a processed meat? It is. And it oh. always breaks my heart a little bit to answer that. Um, but because of the smoking process, it is considered part of the processed meats. Okay. So, um, let's yeah, see. it hurts my heart a little bit, but yeah. Um, how can you address comorbid conditions for someone living with CRC and is also pre-diabetic? Um, the shakes that were recommended possibly have like a lot of sugar or there's, um, can increase it. Yeah. And that it is a challenge. That's where I do recommend working with the dietitian and they may be able to help you with recipes for shakes that, um, that don't have as, as many carbohydrates or as much added sugar. I'm also sometimes dependent on how difficult it is for you to get the nutrition in. We may have to prioritize um, conditions at that point in time and potentially work with your endocrinologist or your other physicians to balance out your medications or kind of balance out the priorities because sometimes it comes down to a little bit of ice cream is going to give you those calories and can it be fit into that? But it, there is no need to kind of throw all your caution to the wind. You know, for instance, like if you do have diabetes, you know, thinking we can do things for snacks like nuts or a cheese stick, a deviled egg. There's lots of things that we can help you with that still may consider that you're not trying to do high sugar or overdo the carbohydrates. Great. Thank you. I think you touched on something that a lot of my patients ask too, is the, um, what is an oncology dietitian and how are they different? And are they just going to assign a diet to me? Is there, you know, um, can you talk about the specialty a little bit and why it's important to seek that out? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions on what a diet, a registered dietitian is going to do for a patient. And I think sometimes patients are afraid I am going to give them like this huge list of do not eats and I'm going to be like the food police. I'm a huge pushover. I'm not a very good food police, but a registered dietitian um, is different than maybe different than a nutritionist. When you meet with a registered dietitian or an RD, you're getting a minimum quality. You're getting someone who at least has their bachelor's degree um, in nutrition or a related field and also has had to complete a supervised practice or an internship and pass an exam. Um, we're also required as registered dietitians to do continuing education to keep our knowledge current. So unlike a nutritionist who may or may not have those standards, with a registered dietitian, you're always getting those standards minimum. And then a lot of times you're, um, you may in your cancer center have what we call a CSO or a certified specialist in oncology nutrition. And that means in addition to being an RD, we have at least two years of experience or several hundred hours of experience working in oncology. And we have taken a specialty exam to show our knowledge in oncology. So many times if you're meeting with an RD CSO, you're getting um, someone who's very specialized in oncology and who has worked in that area for, for quite some time. So we often can um, predict what's coming down the road because we've seen so many patients. We know what you may experience after certain treatments and when we need to change direction. So we can help you to be proactive and make changes at the right times. And thank you so much for that. I think that a lot of uh, people wonder about the background and the specialty and the focus of cancer care and treatment specific, surgery specific, and disease specific. 
is um, your background and training, usually in, in cancer centers. Um, um, a couple of people, we only have um, time for one more, but um, uh, we had a couple of questions about weight loss versus weight gain during and after treatment. Is there like a rule of thumb that um, patients can be aware of or, or know when to talk to their doctors about those things? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I think it's never something to be afraid to bring up, um, especially early on, like what is the doctor's expectation? Or if you're noticing a concern, even if it's just a few pounds, but to you, it's concerning, you want to bring it forward. Because I think honestly, doctors have a lot to cover in appointments. And sometimes weight is not top of the mind. And while we often see people losing weight during treatment, some people will gain weight because they're more hungry or they're eating different foods or they're not as active. And so my thoughts would be if you're noticing a trend in either direction, that would be a great time to bring it forward and get your team's opinion on what, what is normal and expected and what may need some additional intervention. Great. Thank you. And then um, somebody had a question about um, canned tuna, as that was an option. Is that considered a processed meat or no? That is not considered a processed meat. No. Okay. Great. So, and what's nice about, about um, canned tuna and canned salmon is that it's high in omega-3 fats as well. So it's, it's a nice option. Okay. And then one, top of, one last question is about sugar, sugar substitutes. Is there one that's better or healthier? Yes, we do not have the data to support one over the other, honestly. Um, and so it would be a preference. My thoughts on sugar substitutes is that um, if you use them, just like anything, you want to use them in moderation. Um, because I feel like sometimes you, if you give someone a product that is calorie free, they may tend to overuse it. So I was I would just practice moderation, but we don't have concrete um, evidence to support one over the other. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, that is all the questions we have time for today. And I just really want to thank you, Valerie, for spending so much time with us on this important topic. Um, to watch this, for everyone watching, you can watch this video later. You'll soon find it on Blue HQ, the Alliance Online Patient Support Hub, or search CRC Talks. And just thank you, everyone, for attending. And please stick around to answer the post-talk survey, your petition Participation is really important to us as we grow this program. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, thank you.